Hmm. So I, that doesn't look very encouraging, do I? I yawn like that when I first start. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, Hugo Rune, and welcome, Sweet Fox. Salute. Here. All right. You, I have to, you have to phone your sister. All right. Well, uh, you know, thanks for dropping by, Sweet. Thanks for dropping in. You can always watch any time, you know, when you can always watch any time you, uh, you want to. And Hugo Rune. Ben, I've had enough of this hypocrisy. Cannabis is my medication. Can you help me challenge the system? I have the police visiting tomorrow. Oh no, Hugo. Really? Oh no. What? What? Have you got a lawyer? Have you got a solicitor on on your case? Because I mean, you've been on the news. I mean, um, there's Hugo's actually on the news. I remember. Um, if you can find, just post a link. If you can send me the link, I'll play it. You know, well, I'll probably get a bloody copyright strike. But I don't care. I'll play it. Um. But anyway, hello, Bumbelina. How do you do? Welcome, Bumbelina. Hope you're doing all right. Let the masses gather. Oof. Hope all is well with you guys. Yeah, I mean, Hugo, uh, I remember, I, I thought there would be no more trouble because you, you know, you had, um, you were in the news and the news, were, they were backing you up, weren't they? Hey, Rhiannon, how you doing? You all right? Funnily enough, yeah, um, I was just uh, having a call. I was on this sort of Skype call with the people f f from the um, go to we Weird Weekend North. We were talking about ravens. Cool. No worries, Hugo. Um, but you are uh, you were in the news. I remember it was on YouTube, and um, they were very much on your side because you explained your position, you explained your your health problems, your condition, and that the. The cannabis helps you, you know, it helps you, it helps with uh, your problems as it did. It often does, with, especially it's very good for neurological problems. Oh, Rihanna, it's very interesting. Um, they were, we were talking about their intelligence levels and about how they, uh, they seem, they seem to be extraordinarily intelligent. Like all the Corvids, they, they are, um, all the Crow family, they are very intelligent. Hello, Diego Rivera, how are you? Um, and they also they also seem to have a sense of humour. I mean, I, I mentioned um, something that happened in um, at the Tower of London because you know there's loads of ravens there, and um, they will live there. And if you, uh, the rumour has it, if the ravens ever flew away from the superstition is if they ever flew away from the Tower of London, England would fall. So they're very very they're very very careful to keep them there. Yeah, we crows are well, you are Rhiannon. I know that's your totem, isn't it? Hi Phuket, how you doing? But they uh, there was this one incident where one of them died, one of the one of the ravens died, and someone looked out of a window and saw a lion on the grass outside the tower. They said, Oh, that one of them's dead. Whenever one of them dies, they have to have a, they have to be buried. They have a, like a proper grave. And the Black Watch come out and do like a ceremony. And they uh, they all have they then they bury them in the grave. And when this was going on, all the other ravens were kind of watching, very interested in, in this raven being buried. And the next day, uh, someone the same person looked out the window and saw another raven, another raven lying dead on the lawn. And so, oh no, um, there must be a disease going round or something. No, another one's dead. So he went out to pick it up, but the, the the raven wasn't actually dead. He was pretending to be dead. He was just lying there playing dead. And when the man reached down to pick up the raven. It suddenly sat up, pecked him on the finger, and flew away. And it made a noise very like human laughter. Yeah, amazing, amazing creatures. You know. Anyway, guys, thanks for joining us. Now, um, tell me, how many of you have seen the lighthouse? Because this is this is this is basically the live stream part. This is the final part of the three-part watch party for the lighthouse. Um, just to give you a bit of background, The Lighthouse is this film by Robert Eggers. And um, it was very, it's uh, very highly acclaimed. I mean, and most of the, most of the films I review are kind of like very sort of like, they are very sort of fringe and sort of like, usually they get laughed at by the critics. But this one was, this one um, was very successful. It's uh, grossed several billion dollars. It was some. Um, shown at many festivals lots and lots of prizes as i said lots and lots of awards lots of nominations for golden globe oscar etc <clears throat> made in 2019 
And um, as you, um, if you've read the, or if maybe some of you have watched my review, even if you haven't watched the movie, but it is set in the uh, late nineteenth century on an ice on an on a small island where there's a lighthouse, and um, it's very it's one of these very remote ice, uh, very remote lighthouses. Like I say, lighthouses are constrained by geography; they have to go where they're needed, which means some of them are like just perched on rocks in the middle of the sea. Some of them are like built in towns, and you know, the like the lighthouse keepers can sort of like go out to the pub and come back. Others are like literally on rocks in the middle of the ocean. Oh, on, and like this one in Wales, which is what this story is based on, it's actually not far from where, where Rhiannon lives, actually. And um, it's what the story, the story it's based on was actually written, um, it was actually um, a, it was actually originally a sh story, I think, by, uh, was it Edgar Allan Poe or someone? And um, it's, uh, they, they literally have to spend like about a month or more than that, just completely on their own completely on their own isolated from the rest of the world i mean these days lighthouses are automated but before the, i mean this in the past they had things like tv they had telephones they had radios um, towards the end of the time when there were lighthouse keepers and um but before then you were literally you were literally out of touch with the entire world it was just you and your fellow lighthouse keeper in this case thomas wake and ephraim winslow well, it turns out later his name is Thomas Howard. He, um, he takes the identity of a man he killed in Canada when he was a lumberjack. Yeah. Sorry about the spoilers, but I'm assuming people have, people have seen this. I'm assuming they have. Um, all right. No, no worries, Rhiannon. I, mean, I hope you'll still enjoy this particular live stream. Um, hello. Hey, Della, how you doing? Have you seen The Lighthouse, Della? And... Um, Funky Prepper was live, was getting racist. All oh, right, but are you? Oh, have I upstaged Funky Prepper? All oh, right. Yeah, I mean, it's it would suit some people. I mean, um, I think it wouldn't suit me. I mean, I I suppose I'm quite a social person. I could probably tolerate it actually, because well, I've you know I've learned to, I've learned to um, keep myself entertained with my own company over the years. Um, but I um. You've not seen it. Okay, no worries, Della, no worries. Um, obviously, you like these watch parties, the idea, I, what I hope you'll all do is sort of watch it with me, but you don't have to. I mean, it's not obligatory, but that's the purpose of the watch parties. I do an introduction, then we watch the film, then we do the live stream, we talk about it. But it's not, it's not, a, it's not, so you're not under any mandate to do that. You know, I'm not going to say, go away, go away and don't watch this video again until you've watched the film. I'm not going to say that now. <coughs> Oh, thanks. Hugo says, I've not seen it myself. I just enjoy your post. Well, thank you, Hugo. Hello, Keith McLaren. How are you? And um, now there's there's several stories of strange things happening at Lawn Lighthouses. And um, but Alan mentions one here. Right. Well, we maybe we'll the Finian Island Lighthouse case. That's right. Um, let me just get the let me just get the details. I did cover this in the review and I'd covered it in the introduction and review, but I'll bring it up again because um, this is basically where it all comes from. Mm. Okay, this is actually an adaptation of quite an old story. Um, it was an unfinished short story by Edgar Allan Poe, who's a very, very famous um, a writer. He is. Um, he was. He actually he was an American writer in the early nineteenth century, and um, very, very uh, wrote some quite some of some of his stories are really quite iconic. And um, he didn't finish it, but um, he, we. It's kind of like it was finished by editors and people like that because they kind of knew what he was going to talk about because it's based on um, oh, something that happened at the Smalls Lighthouse. Now, Rhiannon will know where this is because it's, it's one of these lighthouses. I told you some lighthouses are like, um, as I said, they're just in the middle of towns. So people can go off to the pub. The keepers can just nip out to the pub or nip out to the shops and things like that. Go home and see their family when they're off duty. But others are literally, like I said, on rocks in the middle of the sea. And this one, the uh, Smalls Lighthouse, is actually on the on a group of rocks known as the Smalls. And it is uh, actually 20 miles out to sea, just west of the Mar Marlois Peninsula in Pembrokeshire. Right off the coast of Southwest Wales, and um, it's uh, 
well, basically, there was a, an incident in 1801, almost 100 years before the uh, before the events you you hear about, and um, almost 100 years before the events that take place in the story. The story is set in the late 19th century, and it's actually off the coast of the northeastern United States and not off the coast of Wales. That's why the, the language is very carefully designed to sound authentic for the type that how people spoke that part of the world in those those days they were very careful to read contemporary lit literature and uh, linguistic studies and things like that but there was a guy called thomas howell yeah he was real and another guy called thomas griffith and they were um is thomas howard was the, sorry the thomas howard is the name of the character and thomas wake they're both called thomas though like um as it happens in this film, the, the two guys are both called Thomas, like Robert Pattinson's character and and um, Willem Dafoe's character. <laughs> but um, they were they were both sent there to man the lighthouse for like a few weeks. They were known to quarrel. They were no, they didn't get on. But uh, Thomas Griffith actually died in an accident. <laughs> and um, Howell was then very concerned that if he. You know, the authorities might accuse him of murder because they knew they didn't get on. So he he sort of hung on to the body, but then the body began to smell a little bit after a while, as you can imagine. So um, Howell built a coffin for the corpse and lashed it to the outside shelf. Now, a stiff wind blew the box apart and the body's arm fell within view of the hut's window. Um, as the winds would blow, Gus would catch the arm and move it in a way that made it look like he was waving or beckoning. It's a bit like Moby Dick, you know, he beckons us, he beckons us, because the dead Captain Ahab, you know, tied to the side of the whale is like moving his hand like that. Um, but Howell kept the light going, even though he's working alone. And um, when, by the time they recognized him, though, he was, by the time they uh, they rescued him, when they basically the new relief arrived, uh, people said he was a bit traumatized. He was never the same again, <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> so the lighthouse authority then made made it um, <coughs> obligatory for three people to man the lighthouses, hmm. and um, it was made into a radio play in 2011 and. Uh, there was a film in 2016 called The Lighthouse. That's interesting. I haven't seen that. And then uh, <coughs> The Lighthouse, of course, by Robert Eggers, which we're talking about now. If you look at the Smalls Lighthouses, it's like everything is... Like, like most lighthouses, they have, like, the tower with the light in, but there's not much in the tower because there's enough room to build, like, a little house nearby for the keepers. That was the case at Portland, certainly. <laughs> But the Smalls Lighthouse, literally because it's just perching on rocks, you can't build anything else. So all the accommodation is actually inside the tower. Everything is inside the tower. And at the top, there's the light. Um, oh, who we got here? We have here... Oh, right, Rian's going to mention the Flannan Islands. That's interesting, isn't it? Oh, detention for Della. <laughs> yeah, Johnny Fettler. Hello, Johnny. How you doing? Hello, Pat Riot. Living in a phallus. Well, it's. I'm sure that uh, sure could make something out of that. Yeah. Now, um, now this is interesting because weird things do happen in lighthouses. The Flannan Islands, off the coast of Scotland, it's off river. And again, like Smalls, it's a very remote lighthouse. And in 90, it was in 1900 that there was uh, something else weird happened. Yeah. Um, of course, weird things do happen in lighthouses, where there's sometimes just guys on their own. I think there were four men. Um, I think there were four men at the Flannan Islands Lighthouse. This is—I showed you it in the introduction, but here we have a look again. There's the Flannan Islands Lighthouse. There's that little old hut there. See, that's that's. Uh, but that's that's the Flannan Islands Lighthouse. Yeah, it's quite something. Um, it's automated, like they all are now. But yeah. Um, this is very interesting. There was a, <coughs> there was some, there was some people there. Three guys, like I said, after after eighteen oh one, three guys had to, three keepers, wikis as they called them. That was a name they also used in Portland. Had to run the lighthouse, and there were three men: James Duckett, Thomas Marshall, and Douglas MacArthur. <coughs> and uh, they had a rotating fourth man who spent time on shore. 
and everything was normal except on the 18th of December, a ship note was passing and noticed, luckily in daytime, so they didn't crash, but they noticed that uh, the light wasn't on and they thought something weird is going on. So they contacted the lighthouse authority and the, the they sent out a boat to investigate and they found everyone had just gone. No one knew exactly what happened. Everything seemed to be left as normal. Um, you know, there was no sign of any struggle. There was no sign of, there's no dead bodies. There was no, no, no disaster had occurred. There were no broken windows. Um, the snow storm had blown them away. It's just, a, it's a bit weird. Um, they just seem to have gone. I mean, the only weird thing, one of the chairs was knocked over, but that was about it. It says here, then here's one of the witnesses who arrived there said, we crowded through the door and we saw the table spread for dinner. There was food on the plate, all untouched. No one was there. It was as if they'd all sat down for dinner. Um, and then an alarm had come and in haste. They'd risen and left everything. And that was it. One, one of the chairs was tipped over. It just, like, just ran out. Why? We don't know. It's a little bit like the Dyatlov Pass incident. There's a film made about it, but it's it's not, I don't know, it's not very, it's not, um, I don't know what the film's like. I mean, the, unfortunately, the, um, the, the trailer gives away a lot of the plot. Yeah. Oh, Genesis wrote a book. John and Genesis made a, in 1968, one of their first albums, Genesis, wrote a song about it. Remind me, I didn't know that. The, the Vanishing, it's a 2018 film. This is it. I'll show you the uh, Pickywedia page. There you go. It's a 2018 British psychological thriller. The problem is that if you look at the trailer, it gives away the plot. It's a bit silly. It gives a theory about what might have happened. It's all to do with... Um, so one of them's got like one of them smuggling gold bars and things like that, and yeah, they sm there's a gold bullion smuggling ring, and some um, some of the lighthouse people are working for that. Weird, isn't it? It's like um, anyway, who's here? Hello, Bernie. How are you doing? Yeah. Old oh, Alan says the official story about the Flannan Islands case was that there was a storm and all three were blown off. Possibly the third man in the process of science trying to save the other two. Well, um. I suppose that makes as much sense as anyone else, as any other. They, although, what was the weather like at the time? I mean, was there a storm at the time? Um, oh, it says, yeah, Marshall made a, a diary entry on the 12th of September saying there were severe winds, very severe winds. And he reported that um, Ducat had been very quiet and MacArthur had been crying. Right. Log entries on the 30th, 13th of December said to have stated the storm was still raging and the three men had been praying. It, it was puzzling as all three men were experienced lighthouse keepers who knew they were in a secure structure, 150 feet above sea level. Furthermore, there were no reported storms in the area on the 12th, 13th and 14th of December. And there was a final log entry on the 15th of December staying, saying specifically, storm ended, sea calm. Thank God it's all over. All right. Currently, fourteen times reckon that the the log ent the log entries were fictional. However, there were no there were no um, there were actually no storms at the time. What it was the the coastline of Ilan Moor is deep. That's the island with the lighthouse on is deeply intent indented with narrow gullies called geos. And uh, one of the, the landing strips is, is, is situated in a geo. And high seas and storm waters could rush into the cave and then come out with considerable force. It's possible that MacArthur saw a large wave, wave approaching the island and, knowing the likely danger to his colleagues, ran down to warn them, only to be washed away as well in a violent swell. Recent research by James Love discovered that Marshall was previously fined five shillings when his equipment was washed away during a huge gale. It's likely, in seeking to avoid another fine, that he and Ducat were trying to save their equipment during the storm and were swept away as a result. But, but why were they there in the first place? The fate of MacArthur, although he seems to be required, he was required to stay behind in the lighthouse, can only be, can be guessed to be the same. 
Love speculates that MacArthur tried to warn his colleagues and was swept away. The the outdoor the, the outdoor clothing, their outdoor waterproof clothing was indoors. So they ran out. Whoever went out there didn't have their waterproof clothing on. There was no storm. But they someone shut the door on the gate on their way out, which is a bit strange. Hmm. A later um, lighthouse keeper said that one man might have been washed into the sea, but then his companions were trying to rescue him and were washed away. But this is the, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, cu it's curious, isn't it? It's curious. I mean, these things do, I do wonder about all these things. Um, I oh, have it anyway. Um, it's just, it's, it's that to me, speculation, of course, it's rather like the uh, MH370, oh, Shah did it. You know, do you remember my? You must have watched my MH370 live stream if you haven't. But yeah, Leon says the official theory about the Flannel Islands case was that there was a yeah. That's it. It's possibly something like that. Roy Bland. Roy Bland is here. I've solved the mystery. Jones was due to give a talk that night. All right, I've had enough of you. I'm blocking you. You. I think you are that same person. You are the same person, aren't you, Roy? I think you are. I think you are the same person who has appeared on Alt Tech. You claim you're not, but then you keep you keep making comments that leads me to believe you are. And if you, you know, that's just I could take a joke from people, but I I know when someone is being malicious or not. So you're gone, my friend or my enemy. So long. Right, and the, yeah, the diaries were revealed to be a hoax. Have you seen um, Rihanna? Have you seen the bedtime story about that? Roy Bland is both rude and bland. He is, isn't he? Well, I got a feeling he's with Team Droik. I got a feeling he's one of the Team Droik trolls. Hmm. Orianon oh, says, I imagine three men on a lighthouse in the middle of the sea is like shooting fish in a barrel for marauding aliens looking for easy picking. Well, yeah, you just gotta wonder, haven't you? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's it's that is a very good bedtime story. It's one of their first ones. Because I, I, I literally went through all the back catalogue of bedtime stories because because it was you who introduced me to it. And um, there's a lot of strange tales of people, people in remote, in remote areas. People, I mean, we know about the missing four four one one. It seems that people in remote areas where they they don't have much contact with other people, where they are, um, they're out of sight, out of mind from the rest of civilization. Keith McLaren says there was actually damage to a steel rope rigging on the landing. Yeah, there would there'd been a storm, Keith. Yeah, I mean, if it happened a few days, if it happened a few days earlier, we could have said the storm. It was something to do with the storm. Although, why do they go out in the storm? We don't know. It's pretty silly to leave the lighthouse and go out when there's wind and there's and there's rain and the rocks are slippery and go right down to the sea level. But there you go. Um, yeah, but uh, the bedtime story is very good. I mean, there does seem to be a, there does seem to be something going on, whether it's aliens or something else, which it seems to be looking for people in remote areas, in places where they're out of sight of mind. For example, in West Wales, putting the bins out for the dustmen. You know, that's a good example of people who might be picked up. And. Um, I mean, it's, this is not universal. I mean, there's there's actually a guy who's a hospital porter investigating a disappearing a disappearance case in Glasgow, where a, a guy disappeared basically in in a, in a crowded street. But it's mostly people in remote areas, and um, something something strange happens. They disappear, or something goes wrong. In the case of the lighthouse, <clears throat> I mean, just imagine though, if um, in the case of the lighthouse is actually very loosely based. Excuse me. On the small islands, tragedy, but it's not actually, it's not a, a reproduction. It's not like um, exactly the same thing. It's the plot is different to the true story. Rianon, I think Hospital Porter Investigates would be a great title for a TV series. Well, I'm hoping my brother Porter, I've been in touch with him actually, is he's writing a book about this. Yeah, it's very interesting. I'll tell you about it in a minute, but um. It does seem, in the case of The Lighthouse, this film, the two guys who are 
on this lighthouse together. It's pretty clear. Well, firstly, they're they they both they're both quite dark characters. For example, um, the the young guy, the the younger guy, the Howell, the Winslow Howard character. He of course is living a double life. He's he killed someone. He's he um well he, I say killed. He um he he was working as a lumberjack in Canada, and his um his foreman was someone he really disliked and was horrible to him. So when this foreman slipped into a river with the logs, when they were they were putting logs in the river, this guy slipped in, and was swept away by the river. He screamed, begging for for. Howard to come and save him, and Howard didn't. He took that opportunity just not to save him and let him die. And so, in in a sense, he's a passive killer. In that sense, rather like my character in my the Obscurity Chronicles. If you know the Obscurity Chronicles, this serial I'm writing, one of the characters is in that position themselves. They don't actually murder someone, but someone they're in a position where someone falls ill and they need urgent medication. They can't get it themselves, and he withholds it from them. So they die. Now Thomas Wake, this this uh, the older guy played by Willem Dafoe, he is a, an abrasive, drunken, two-faced tosser. Basically, I couldn't get on with him. You know, I mean, if you you know if you in the story, you'll know what he's like. And I I couldn't get on with that guy. And what happens is they both lose their minds. They both go crazy. Well, it looks like that Wake is already crazy. I mean, he's got this obsession with the light. He he goes up. He, he stands naked in front of the light, and it's 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 not actually shown graphically. It's hinted that he masturbates in front of this light, and he won't let Winslow Howard go near the light. He says the light is mine, which of course in a real lighthouse you couldn't do because they have to take it in turns. One has to get to sleep while the other one looks after the light. It's an oil lamp. It has to be continuously um, fed by by oil and things like that. And he has to, the wick has to be looked after, and because otherwise ships will crash into the rocks. Yeah. Hello, Angela. How are you? Yeah. How are How are you? Should I be worried living in the middle of nowhere, Johnny? I mean, look. I, I always say this when I talk about the missing 411. You know, I mean, you know, the great outdoor sports and recreation is a great American tradition. Millions of people go and they they hike and they fish and they hunt and they go around the, the remote parts of North America um, all the time. Canadians, US, in the Canada and the US, millions of them do it every summer and they have a wonderful time and nothing bad happens to them. I mean, the, the worst danger and the worst dangers you can fear probably you, you, there's things like cougars and bears, like predatory animals. There's the risk of having an accident in a remote area, that, things like that. You know, the, the actual disappearances that Paul Ides investigates are a tiny minority, a tiny minority of the, the various adverse incidents that happen in remote areas of north america in fact it's possible that some of the people i mean i know the skeptics say this it's possible that some of the people he investigates there is a more conventional explanation for what happened to them not always but there is sometimes diego rivera they did not have internet back then in the lighthouse seeing as this is the 1890s i don't think that's very likely yeah um did the guy who let the guy putting logs out the water get prosecuted no he stole his identity and then fled and he fled. That's how he, and then he got the job. He applied for the job of a, as a lighthouse keeper under the name of the man he killed or allowed to die. What's this, Fouquet? The Blood in the Machine by Brian Merchant. What's that? What's that? Um, I'll just wiki it. Town's very, sounds like something from a slaughterhouse. No, I can't. There's nothing here. But anyway, um, not heard of that. Anyway, welcome, welcome, Ricardo. How are you, Ricardo? Yeah, how are you? Anyway, uh, Jack. Um, who else have we got? Anyone new? Um, oh, cool, Angela. That's nice to know. Jack Doors, Jack Doors. Says Hugo. Hello, Neil. <laughs> Sneaking in the back row. <laughs> yeah. Just a side hustle. 
the um the funny thing is there are some sort of like some weird kind of hitchcockian moments in the, the lighthouse with the seagulls i mean the the way the seagulls come down have any of you seen it i mean maybe none of you have seen this film it doesn't matter if you haven't it's not the end of the world if you haven't just um, just thought just wondered but um i'll tell you about, i'll tell you about the I'll tell you a little bit about the, because this is, I know we're going a bit off topic here, but it's inevitable. If, if none of you have seen it, it's pretty inevitable. We'll go off topic quite a lot. Where are we? Um, someone actually requested this. I mean, who, who's, I can't, who's it requested it? I keep forgetting. I'm sorry. But, um, but he's obviously seen it and he, I don't think he's here. It doesn't exist. It's all an illusion. What's that? What life, the universe, everything? <laughs> Let me just show you this. Is it still there? Hopefully, this. Um... Yeah, yeah, this is uh, this is interesting. This is interesting. This is the Glasgow Times. Here we go. Chilling mystery of a Glasgow teenager who vanished in 1966. I actually read this was in Janet and Colin Board's book, Modern Mysteries of Britain, which I, I it actually really scared me when I first read heard about this when I was a, a kid. Alex Cleghorn, yes. Now author Andy Owens is writing a book called The British X-Files. I'll just go, carry on. No, it says a bit more about Andy Owens here. Because, um, um, let's have a look. Um, it's gonna, here we go. Um, I just want to read a little bit more about his biography. Because it's, uh, yeah, it always says here, I first read about the Alex Cleghorn mystery in a 1987 book called The Modern Mysteries of Britain by Janet and Colin Board. Great porters think alike. Yes. Here we go. Andy, who is a hospital porter who writes books, Porter's Pride and Dignity, as a, and a blog as a hobby, says he's an open-minded skeptic. And always been fascinated by unsolved mysteries. I, I emailed this guy. He, wrote, he emailed me back. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let me just. Is, is he making any more progress on the books? This was a couple of months ago. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. I'll be with you in a minute. The British X Files, Andy Owens, because he does. I've read his. I've read a bit of his blog. Hmm. Here we go. It's, this is him, I think. All right, this is my brother Porter. This is my proud, extremely proud, extremely dignified brother Porter. He writes books. His latest is Ghosts, First Hand Account of the Supernatural. He also writes the blog Spooky Vacation and articles for The Skeptic. All oh, right. Oh, dear. Well, no one's perfect. And is a member of the research charity ASAP. He's a member of ASAP. His blog is, blog is called Scoop Spooky Vacation. It's not as good as hospital. It doesn't quite ring as much as Hospital Porters Against the New World Order. I mean, he could have called it Hospital Porters Investigating of the Paranormal or something, couldn't he? But here's one of his books, Ghosts. Mm. No results found. All right, okay. But here's some of his articles. Phantoms at the Fleece, a visit to Poltergeist House. Yeah, it says here that he um, he works as a hospital porter. Pride and dignity. Well, no one works as a hospital porter because hospital portering is not a job. It is a calling. It is a life. It's what we do. It's what we are. It's not a job. He lives in West Yorkshire. All right, he's not a, a Glasgow native. Not that matters. Uh, writes articles for the Skeptic. Oh well. Is this? Oh yeah, here we go. Look. The skeptic, reason with compassion, bizarre double death, spontaneous human combustion, or merely a tragic coincidence by Andy Owens. I've got to interview this guy. I've got to interview him. When his book comes out, I've got to interview him. But there you go. He's um he's a hospital porter, but a skeptic. All right. Right, hello, hello, Pat Riot. How you doing? All right. Uh you have seen it, Pat. Oh, cool, cool. 
Um, you don't remember, can't remember much about it. Well, it's been described by um, one of the critics as um, a kind of uh, a very dark Steptoe and Son. <laughs> Hello, Ralph Winter. 42? 42? Oh, that's the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. Yes, I know. I know these. You can spot a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy, fan. Diego Rivera says, "Oh, some lighthouses are still manned in certain places of the world. It could be that um, there, there may be some very remote ones that where you need to have someone to maintain them." Yeah. Um, hmm. The android wasn't paranoid. He was just miserable. Oh, he's Marvin. Yes. Uh, life. Don't talk to me about life. Ricardo. Ben, I was told that ghosts and paranormal are fake before 1800. There were no ghost stories. And it's all stirred up by the media. Your thoughts? <laughs> Ricardo, that's nonsense. That's total nonsense. Mm. Hugo Rune. What do you get if you multiply six by nine? Well, you'll have to ask the, the cavemen who are playing Scrabble, which Arthur Dent is trying to teach them. All right. But yeah, Andy Owens. I'll have to uh, keep an eye on your books. Let's see. He's got. I look. His published books are ghosts. He hasn't. Right. Ghosts are Eric. A portrait of Eric Portman. The police and the paranormal. I'm, oh, sorry. I'm not showing you them. I'm not showing them to you. Here we go. He's written quite a few. So I'm probably the second most prolific hospital portrait writer. He's probably the most. So he's R. Eric, a portrait of Eric Portman. Hmm. The police and the paranormal. Walking on air. My quest for adventure along Yorkshire's exotic river. All oh, right. Paranormal West Yorkshire. No, it's haunted Bradford. What took place in Yorkshire's killer catchers? Haunted Dorset. The complete visitor's guide to Loch Ness, Inverness, and the Loch Ness monster. Yorkshire stories of the supernatural. Whoa. Honestly, man, I mean, I, I, I'll have to email this guy again. I will. Definitely. Coda, hello. How are you, Coda? Well, hi-ho and jolly well, Code. Pridely dignifold and punch it in the sky bowl there. Deep Joe, yeah. I think I'm getting the hang of this unwinnies. I really am. I'm sort of learning it. The sky bowl, yes. Oh, uh, That's good to you. Sit your bocus down, Coda, and... Um, have a, and enjoy yourself. So yeah, the story of Alex Cleghorn is um, is a pretty scary one. Basically, again, we're talking about from the missing four eleven that they weird things happen to people in remote areas. This was this was this was New Year's Eve, nineteen sixty six. Literally, it was the last day of the year, and Alex was walking along the. Um, he was he was first footing now. First footing is something I think unique to Scotland. And um I oh, was sorry, no, it was it was the New Year's, it was the I, I said the last day of the year, it was the first day of the year, it was the early hours of New Year's Day, nineteen sixty six. So it's easy to do that when you're talking about the new year, but he was first foot in. So the new the new year just started. And now if anyone who's Scotland anyone who's Scottish will know that New Year New Year is a very different thing in Scotland than it is in England and most other countries. It says it's in England, it's really just an extension of Christmas, isn't it? And a chance to have a few more drinks and polish off the polish off the Xmas booze. In Scotland, it has traditions. It has a, it's is a festival, a major festival, and they call it Hogmanay, Hogmanay, New Year's Eve, and it, it, this the Hogmanay celebrations go over into New Year's Day. There's first footing, and first footing involves things like having house parties, and you let strangers into your house. And the person with the darkest hair in the family has to bring home a lump of coal and things like that uh, to have good years for the good good luck for the following year. Now he was actually out. Um, I think that's how you spell it, Hugo. People can people can correct me. Hogmanay, yeah. Is I think there's a no, I think it's M A N A Y, not M H O G M A N A Y. I think it is. But um, he was out, this guy, Alec Cleghorn, was out with his family and they were just walking along Govan Road. I've been there. Have you seen my, I actually investigated this myself. Well, at least I've visited the location. It's a place called Govan Road. And I went there specifically in 2016 at the Scottish UFO and Paranormal Conference. And um, I went to the location where it happened or around the, I mean, it's a long road. It's, it goes quite a long way. But he was walking along there with his friends and they just looked around and they realized he wasn't with them. And he's just gone. 
No one saw. He didn't sort of like go pop, and there was a puff of smoke or anything like that. He just looked around, and says, "Where's Alec?" And he was gone. Yeah. Oh, Hugo says, "My mum is Scottish and my dad is Dutch origin." Oh, right. That's uh, you're half Dutch like me. It was my mum who was Dutch. But yeah, that's uh, that's a strange mixture, Hugo. Yeah. Hmm. Ah, Hugo. Yes, come to visit Spliffs in Tin. Oh, yes. Well, we've been e we will we. We've been emailing about that, haven't we? Yeah, so we will be coming to visit you soon. But we'll we'll arrange a time. We'll definitely arrange a time. But um, in the case of the lighthouse, of course, they do die. Well, I mean, as I said, this uh, I'm assuming that so people don't mind having spoilers because this is the watch party, the, the final section of the of the of the watch party. This is the watch party final section. But of course. Howard Wils Howard Winslow kills kills Wake with an axe. They have a, they have well Wake tries to kill him first and they have a fight and then after they, they fought they fought several times and then um Wake and he kills Wake and then of course he goes up to the light and they have that scene, that really creepy scene where he looks into the light and there's this it's it's almost like there's some kind of supernatural force in the light. I mean I I've I'm certain, obviously, that's actually not what this is about. It's it's pretty clear they've lost their minds. I don't think there's there's really a supernatural force in them in the light. It's possible. I don't think there's any implication that anything really esoteric is going on. They've just gone crazy. They've just they've just lost it. Maybe it could be because they've just drunk too much and the loneliness and the fact they don't get on and they you know, they, they wake as a very prickly character. Very difficult lie. He tells lies about his fellow lighthouse keeper in the logbook and things like that. And of course, he he drops him when he's painting the outside of the lighthouse on on the bosun's chair. And um, they drink heavily. In the end, when they run out of proper drink, they start. The, they have turps and honey. I mean, oh, good grief! Yeah, <sighs> yeah. The runes of Schoon. Hugo is a rune. All right, you've Hugo is, is, is sort of given his real name here, Michael Sparham. The Dutch origin is Sparsam, yeah. But yeah, this, I mean, people know who you are, Hugo, because you do have you have been in the news under your own name. Hmm. Hakoda says Ben is Duplo Dotchari. Joan Jones is Welsh sheep and love it there. Oh yes, we love our sheep, don't we? All Doffy Caploader and Prostrate there. He's all speak at the wordage. Unwin most deep joy. Yeah, well, I'm picking it up bit by bit. You coder, I am. I am. But I mean, of course, it, at the end, they're both dead. I mean, well, it's, it's you. I don't think um, there's any implication that, that Winslow will survive because he's being eaten by seagulls when he's lying there. He's lying there half semi conscious, and the seagulls are just eating him. They're picking his guts and everything. Sweeps, I wonder why you took this on, Ben. Such a brooding, dystopian, psychopathic tale, you know. Well, Sweeps, believe it or not, it was a request. It was a request from a viewer, and I, I keep forgetting who it was. Uh, they did say who it was, and because I asked them before, and they owned up. And um, yeah, I uh, he he was a viewer, and he um, and he asked to, to he asked for a watch party for this film. I do take requests for. For watch parties, I mean, what dreams may come? The watch read party we did—that was also a request. But it is, it is a—it's not a cheerful film, is it? I mean, it's—it's it's this monochrome, you know, square-framed like portrait. As it says, it's like an, an unfunny steptoe and son about these two guys who uh, can't get along, and they're stuck on this rock together, manning this lighthouse, and. Well, the, the older guy is already a bit nuts, and of course, Will Swinslow has this. this he has this um, secret, which is preying on his mind, and um, and of course, they they do go crazy. They lose their minds. It's a, it's a story. It's a nervous breakdown. It's probably the best portrait. It's the best portrayal I've seen, and the most um, and the most sort of graphic and. Um, disturbing since taxi driver of a nervous breakdown someone suffering a nervous breakdown 
taxi driver is of course about a a man who is a taxi driver and he just he has a he has a mental relapse an episode where he does he goes crazy yeah it was not no it wasn't it wasn't you Phuket no I can't remember I can't remember who it was they're not here this evening anyway but that's kind of like um hmm. So was the movie. Three men get mad in a lighthouse. It was only two. It was two Fouquet. There was just two. There were only two main. There were only two real characters in it. I mean, there's a, you know, there's people out of sight who because it begins when they arrive with a boat at a boat. They arrive in a boat at the island where the lighthouse is. It's all dark and grim, and then they don't speak to the crew coming out. It's like they cross paths. And that was really weird because they're walking up to the lighthouse with all their luggage and belongings in their suitcases ready for a month on the on the rock and the crew that's being taken back is leaving at the same time they don't say hey how's things going you know there's no handover situation when i change shifts with my brother porters we'd like there'd be a handover period where we would uh, brief each- we would brief the new shift on what was going on and we'd exchange some pleasantries shoot the breeze for a bit and maybe even stop for a cup of tea or something and then the but they've done that. They just like cross each. They put, they walk past each other. It's literally like that, which indicates there's something wrong. There is something wrong with this lighthouse. And those are the only, the only other characters: the mermaid, of course, who is a figment of Winslow's imagination. Hmm. Got the, ah, you take it. The questy home, maybe a watchly party load. Of five people odes you meet in the heavenly boat. Oh yes, the f- oh the five people you meet in heaven. That is really good. That is re- that's a really good book. That's a really good book. Um, is that a request coder? Because I could do. I'd like to do that actually. Five, five people you meet. Mitch Al. Here we are. This is a really good. This is a really good book. I was given this right. Here we go. Um. The Five People You Meet in Heaven, a 2003 novel by Mitch Album. Now, that's, that is good. That is very, very good. I'm going to make a note of that. I'm, I'm going to make, as soon as I do take requests, so I'll make a note of that. Here we go. Right. Scroll down. Where are we? Okay. Because that's a great idea. That really is. Watch party. Watch. I've still got a watch read party because it's a book. There is a film. There's a film ba- it's based on. Watch read party. Okay, five people you meet in heaven. Uh, the, I've I read the book. What, what, what happened was I went to the I went to the Findorn community in uh, in the remote in the remote part of um, that's up in Scotland. Not that, not that remote. It's on the coast. Um, I, I was I felt very I felt very driven to to go on the experience week at the Findhorn community. It was actually a bit of a disappointment and. Um, a bit of a disillusioning experience, and I wrote an article about it. If you want to read the article, it's on the main Hapanwo blog. I wrote it in 2005. Um, and this is actually this is actually I actually didn't start Hapanwo till the following year. So I oh no, I must have I must have written it. When did I write it? Because I didn't start Hapanwo till 2006. Just one moment. Just one moment, guys. Oh, no, it was until 2011. Right, okay. That's a surprise. Here we go. Well, here's the article, Findhorn, 14th of March, 2011. Okay, so it's... Anyway, I, I, I it happened in 2005. I went there in 2005, did the experience week. And um, when I was leaving this... Um, there were, I mean, I met some really nice people. Like I said, it was very new age and... I was sort of dabbling with the new age in those days. I'd already sort of seen through most of it, but I'd been to, I used to go to the Brahma Kumaris Center. Do you remember my video New Age where I went to the Brahma Kumaris Center? I was already getting a little bit slacker over the new age at that time. And if you you know what I mean, if you've ever watched Slaxer and what he says about the new age. <coughs> um, attach snap after tedious snap after tedious snap. And um but um when I was leaving, there were some nice people. She gave me this book, and she said to me, 
oh, whenever I read this, this is a book you've got to hand on to someone else. So whenever you finish, when you finish reading it, hand it on to someone else. And it was this book, The Five People You Meet in Heaven by Mitch Album. And um, I won't show, I won't show you, the, I'll show you the cover. There it is, the cover of it. It had a different cover actually when I was there, but here we go. The Five People You Meet in Heaven by Mitch Album. Album, not album as in a big record. Album. But it was made into a film, which was actually quite good, quite a, quite um, a faithful adaptation. And um, it tells the story of this old man, and um, it's about it's it's similar to what dreams may come. He dies, he goes to heaven, he he has encounters with various spirits and things like that. But you know that is actually um, Coda. That is actually that's actually a good idea. And I, I like five the five people owed you meet in the heavenly bode. I'll I'll, I'll I'll I won't. I won't call the video that. I'll, I'll call it the English version. But yeah, it's a great book. It's a it's a really really good book. So yeah, a watch read party is a good idea. Now there used to be a film of it on it used to be on Vimeo. I don't know if it's still there, but there was the the film was a freebie on Vimeo originally. Hmm. Definitely a really really good book. All right, I'll. I think we'll. Shall I, I'm going to finish soon, actually, because um, I think we sort of covered it all, haven't we? I mean, um, Hugo says, oh, "Sorry, not Hugo." Sweeps. Okay, we didn't run into each other at Findhorn. Was there? Um, went to the times to their origins. X to their origins are interesting. The videos and books are good. Had a tarot reading there and a massage. Not telling lot. All oh, right. Yeah, there was. A, there's a good. There's a bookshop there. You get all sorts of new age material there um you can't get you can't get like conspiratorial stuff like david ike but you can get like lots of like sp work on spiritual spirituality philosophy stuff like that and then um, they do there's massages there's aromatherapy there's healing it's a spiritual community um and it was set up in the early 60s there was a lady called eileen caddy who uh, went there with her husband and they they she she said she was getting she had the communications from what she called god that told her to go and, and go and live in a caravan on this this sand dune, and she started growing vegetables. And the vegetables, despite the fact you can't, it's difficult to grow vegetables in sand. These vegetables were like really, really big. They won awards, and more and more people came along. And all, it, this is when the hippie movement got going, and so it became like a um, like a, a hippie mecca. And eventually, it's they started having like a you know, they taking visitors, and the visitors there was like a, a proper structured course, and they started like a, it became like a tourist thing. You know, you it's actually quite expensive to go. It cost me like five hundred plus pounds. It was only I was only there a week, but it cost five hundred quid because you're paying for full time tuition as well. And I must admit, I did, I didn't dislike it most of it, but I just I don't I don't have time. I won't go into it now. You can read my review. But like a lot of new age things, I found it had this kind of dark side. It had this, it had this sort of, it had this sort of treacly kind of malevolence to it. Treacly, it was kind of all, it was all sweetness and light. But under the surface, it was there was some malevolence. I mean, Slaxer made this really kind of. Um, Slaxer puts it very well, actually. All basey most on the scrib. Scribe loads old odd borgy Swede loader, you know. Boy Swede loader is that Swedenborg? Oh yeah, <laughs> Emmanuel Swedenborg. Yeah, uh, they were they were into things like um, they were into Rosicrucianism, they were into Theosophy, you know, Helena Blavatsky, all that kind of thing. There were some of them were into spiritualism, some of them were into the Kabbalah. There was all kinds, of, any kind of esoteric kind of like. Um, early 20th century alternative spirituality was covered. There were no mediums there. I mean, I did meet one person who trained as a medium, um, but spiritual spiritualism was not really a big thing at that time. But you see, that, that was in the days when I was sort of dabbling with the New Age. I um, I had a friend in, in, the, in the 90s who was a New Ager, a quite a close friend. But um, again, she had this... She was one of these pseudo friends. I mean, you've got to be 
you've got to be careful that you make friends within this world. I mean, if I was writing in the big issue, you know, you know, if I was when they interview people in the big issue, if you ever read the big issue, you buy it off the homeless people. They have this. Uh, they have an interview with with someone, and they uh, usually a celebrity, and and then they say, "What what advice would you give your younger self?" If you could give your your younger self advice, my advice would be: be careful who you make friends with. Just because people say they're your friend and they act nice some of the time, that doesn't mean they are your friend. And this this person, this new age person, I knew should know this sort of like uh, this lady I knew. I mean, I don't know. She's still she's probably not alive now. She was much older than me. Um, and I knew her sort of when I was in my twenties and that. She was. Um, She'd be nice to me at certain points when, when, when we were on our own together. She'd be pleasant and friendly. When other people came up, she started talking down to me, like she was showing off in front of them by by being rude to me. And like she patronizing and condescending. And um, in the end, I confronted her over it. It was just a couple of years before I went to Findhorn, and she just exploded at me. She called me every name imaginable, said some really cruel things to me, because she knew a lot about me, because we... We talked um, intimately, and so she knew my sort of weak points, and she knew what buttons to press, and she had some horrible things, and she stormed off. Never saw her again. So be careful who you make friends with in this world. Oh, hello, David Yorkshire. How are you doing? I used to be a medium until I was 15, but then I grew into an extra large. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Lots of gypsies there, Fintorn, says Sweep. Nice craft pottery, and even Zen. Crystal ball readings and the Vril, believe it or not. Well, I didn't know about the Vril. I mean, the Vril is something really more extreme. The Vril, When you get into the Vril, you'll get into the areas of, like, uh, Orgone and things like that. Um, that's sort of heavy industrial type um, energy channeling and stuff like that. You, it's something you can't mess with. It's, it's potentially dangerous. But um, but I didn't know they did. That. I didn't know there were real people there and things like that. I saw crystal balls and Zen meditation. We did Zen meditation in the sanctuary and things like that, and the crafts and pottery. It's very nice, yeah. But um, yeah, there was. I don't think I could live. You see, a lot of people they do the experience week and then they stay. They go on to do another course called Echol Experience Community Living, which is another week. And then you go on and on. Eventually, they get they become like star. They join the staff there. They buy houses there and things. I, I couldn't do. I mean, I couldn't fit in there. I wouldn't fit in there. Ricardo says, I had a quote unquote friend who was exactly like that. Totally different with me and other people around. Yeah, um, it's just it's 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 one of these lessons you learn. I mean, I afterwards I thought to myself, why did I even have anything to do with this bitch? Because we've been friends for about ten years, and I thought, why? Yeah. Coda says, real friendly most of those people owed who you profoundly disagreed but still kissy cuddle owed. Oh, yes. Of course, yes. She, Coda, yeah. I mean, I, I I never get angry with people for disagreeing with me. I mean, like I said, this got this porter. Well, he's a, well, it's different because he's a brother porter. I mean, you know, even though if he was not a brother porter, I would still kind of, um, I still wouldn't get angry with him for being a skeptic. I like Chris French. He, Chris French invited me to speak at his conference, and I did. Rian says here, she sounds like someone with a personality disorder. Uh, he, Rian, I told you about this person before. Yeah, you, you you did sort of mention this to me. In my humble experience, the new age scene tends to attract such types, particularly those with narcissistic personality disorder. Yeah, it does. I wouldn't fit in with Findor. I met, they would see one of the, what they call the focalizers. That's the people leading the group. One of them was was a little bit bitchy. And I, and I, I she, was this, she was this rather... She was all right. She was this Japanese girl. I say girl. She's she's probably a couple of years older than me, but she was this Japanese lady, and she she would. Tr I, I got the feeling she was imposing different rules on me than she was imposing on the others in the group. David Yorkshire, Les Brigandes, if you remember that French group, were all into the real stuff. I visited an inter and interviewed them in their commune. Right. I don't know. I'm the the Les Brigandes. It sounds like brigands. Uh, David, I, I've not heard of them. Les Brigandes. But you visited them. Oh, my God. Did I mean, the real stuff, like, it was literally, like, we're, we're talking about building working flying saucers and stuff like that. And, indeed, what happened was the, um, the, the real was, the real, of course, was, the real energy was explored by 
by a lady called Sylvia Ortiz, who was a medium. This all connects to the Helen Duncan thing, by the way. Um, and she was like a, she was a close confidant of a, uh, a certain gentleman from Austria, shall we say, a, a very maligned and misunderstood artist. And of course, this this artist was very keen to build weapons to to protect his country, and um, he was willing to he was willing to use any means necessary, including he he and his um, and the Ananerb and people like that were exploring the occult. They visited Tibet. They visited south of France, the Cathar country, and things like that. And what what's that's that's known by history. But what is much less known by history is that the Allies were doing the same. That in our country, in Britain, there were people like Ian Fleming, who's wrote he wrote James Bond, and Brigadier Roy Firebrace. These were these were top intelligence officers who knew who who. Look, this is why they took an interest in Helen Duncan because they realised that Helen Duncan was an unpluggable leak. I've done an entire. I'm not going to repeat myself. I've done an entire talk about that. Fouquet says, I, I did a working visit at a Buddhist community and ended up staying five years. I mean, I like that. Yeah, I mean, I can understand. Fouquet, I've been to a, a Buddhist temple and, and, and the peace, the, like the, I went to one, it was actually in West London and the the peaceful energy there and, and the, the, the energy the people give off, it's really nice. I, mean, I didn't detect this at Findhorn. I mean, I did detect, like I said, there were some really nice people there, some really li likable people. The lady who gave me the book, who gave me the book by Mitch Album. So I did read it. I actually read it on the journey home. And when I got to Oxford, I did. I did exactly what she told me to. Pass it on to someone else. I didn't actually give it to someone else. But in the Oxford station, there's like a little bookshelf where you can just donate books and for people to read on the train. So I just left it there. Mm. Cannabis, zero deaths ever. Yeah. And, and I know alcohol deaths. You, you make that point over and over. And it's true, Hugo. It's true. Yeah. Kind of like Rihanna. Oh, you like Rihanna? Oh, because one of my daughters is named Rihanna. Same spelling. Oh, well, she's very nice, Sweeps. I'm, I know her personally. I've, I've met her and several times. You know, I'm going to meet her again in a couple of weeks. Yeah. And she is. She's great, Sweeps. She really is. Anyway, guys, I've been going an hour, and we we completely gone off topic. <laughs> I thought that might happen. Actually, it does with these watch parties. But anyway, guys, um, I want to say a big thank you to everyone who's taking part in this little live stream here. Hugo Rune, Phuket, Sweeps Foxman, um, David Yorkshire, Julianon, Coda, Ricardo, Johnny Fettler. F I've said Phuket, haven't I? Um, who else is there? Oh, Angela Kenyon. And Ralph Winter. And Pat Riot. Thank you very much, all of you. It's much appreciated. Uh, oh, oh, David, Vril seems to be made up by Edward Buller Lytton. Um, well, I mean, that's that's a big subject. That's a big. Oh, Della, Della, thank you, Della. I could do an entire live stream on that, David. We'll bring it up again another time. But um, you know, thank you all of you. It's been a, it's been a brief but fun live stream. I came here to talk about the lighthouse, and we did. And we went up in a lot. We we went off on a lot of tangents and covered a lot of interesting subjects. So um, I thank you as always for those. Well, what's coming next? You're welcome. You're welcome, Ralph. Well, um, there's going to be a comments reply video probably on Sunday. I'll try. Now next week I've got some plans. There's going to be like a roving review sort of outdoor video. You've been. I haven't done one of those for a while, so I'm good. And some of you've been asking for one. Oh, Bumbelina, thank you, thank you very much, Bumbelina. Night, night, nighty night, Rhiannon. Hang on, here we go. Nighty night. Nothing wrong with a tangent or two, exactly. Village is a novel load from eighteen seventy six. It's fiction load. All oh, right. Well, we could we could like go into a lot of big discussion about that. Um. But good night, Bumbelina, and see how we are living. Good night. Thanks for coming. See how we are living. Yeah, it's um, there's going to be next week. There is going to be an outdoor video. I'm doing a kind of um, I'm doing I'm doing a roving review of something. It's it's um, I won't, I'll, I'll tell you when it. Well, you'll know when you watch the video. But I'm doing a roving review, and it's not Dune Part Two. I'm not going to go and see that. As I, I said, like soon after I did Part One, and, and I did the roving review Part One. It's a substandard. 
I thought the the first part one was it was nowhere so so substandard compared to the David Lynch adaptation that I said let's do let's do a June watch read party of that instead. So I've got, I've got to do the rest of that, haven't we? Yeah. And uh, what else is happening? Um, next week. Oh right, well next I'm um, joining Mark Devlin for the Oxford tour next Friday. Do come along if you can. Um, it's only your details are on markdevlin.com, and you can go to go to his Rumble channel where he talks about it. But, um, Rihanna, was it bloody? I know you went to see it. It looked bloody awful. Well, the, the part part one was shite um, compared to the book and compared to the Lynch adaptation. And so when I saw part two, I thought, no, nah, forget it. Forget it. Anyway, thank you all of you for, for taking part in this brief but fun live stream. Hospital Port as pride and dignity. Stop the New World Order. <laughs>